Hello everyone, this is Josh Ronquist here for the Heavy Debriefings YouTube channel, and it's now time to talk about my top 10 albums of 1999. And yes, I would like to think these 10 albums are what Prince was talking about when you wanted to party like 1999, despite the fact that it came out in 1982, but regardless, let's get into it. Coming in at number 10 is Paradise Lost, with the album that spawned the 2023 album and band, Host. And this is a fantastic album. It's a bit of a culture shock if you've never checked out the middle era of Paradise Lost. I mean, if you only know them as a gothic doom band or as a gothic rock heavy metal band, the middle era of Paradise Lost probably makes you raise your eyebrow because it's more alternative rock, it's more industrial, it's more gothic, and a little bit of dark wave, that 80s dark wave sound. And Host is like the culmination of all of that combined. And I can only imagine that's why they named the new project with Gregor and Nick Host. But for a lot of people, this era is a forgotten era. And I'm so glad that they were able to create an album to showcase the style of Host. Because it is so fun to listen to. I mean, if you can get out of your preconceived notions of just listening to the heaviest metal possible and you're able to just appreciate dark music. Paradise Lost is one of the best bands you can find that in almost every style that you can think of. Death, doom, gothic, alternative, industrial, everything. Paradise Lost does it in strides, and Host might be the shining example of all of that. And if that sounds intriguing to you, absolutely check this one out. And coming in at number 9 is the first appearance of a band that means so near and dear to me on this series, Porcupine Tree, with Stupid Dream. To me, everything from Stupid Dream all the way to the last album, which, I mean, from all intents and purposes, sounds like it will be the last that Porcupine Tree ever does, that's my era of Porcupine Tree. Like, I appreciate that they could do more psychedelic stuff and a little bit more droney stuff and basically music that you really need to be on acid to truly appreciate, but I appreciate when it was more of the song structures. I love the fact that Porcupine Tree could be a pop band, a metal band, a prog band, an alternative band all at once. And that really started here with Stupid Dream. There's so many great pop sensibilities on this album. There's some heavier moments that happen, although that would happen more as the band would continue on from this point on. But it really feels like a great change in the band at this moment. And that's my era. And if you want to check out where Porcupine Tree is not so metal, not really even that proggy, but they're more poppy and they're more alternative more than anything else, I highly recommend checking out Stupid Dream. It's a stupidly good album. I apologize for the pun. Coming in at number 8 is easily the darkest album from this particular band, Nevermore, with Dreaming Neon Black. A concept album loosely based on reality, where a man loses a significant other to a religious cult and slowly starts to go insane. Of course, some things were changed up, and when you look into the reality of that situation with Warl Dane, it's even scarier than what actually happens on the album. Which, you know, life can be stranger than fiction. Bad religion and so many other people have said that before. But this is the last Nevermore album of the Six String era. Of course, next year, without question, we're going to be talking about the band's highest watermark with Dead Heart in a Dead World, but... I don't want people to forget the early eras of Nevermore because it is truly spectacular music as well. And this album is a perfect personification of all of that. It has an amazingly dark, twisted story. The songs are so good. Jeff Loomis' solos are just jaw-dropping as always. And of course, Warl Dane proves why he's one of my favorite vocalists of all time, and I'm so sad that he's still gone. Every single Nevermore album is worth cherishing and enjoying, and unless, again, you're really into Nevermore, and you enjoy the six-string era of Nevermore, you don't really know about Dreaming Neon Black, and that is a shame. If you enjoy Nevermore from Dead Heart onward, you owe it to yourself to check out the six-string era. And this is the album you need to start with, Dreaming Neon Black. In another concept album about a man losing his loved ones, it's Opeth with Still Life. And if you can tell by this one being number 7 and how much I enjoy this album, 
this was a very hard year to put this top 10 together because I can't believe I found six albums I enjoy more than this because I love Still Life and I think it's arguably their best album. I still think it would be Blackwater Park in my personal opinion and I still have my love for My Arms Your Hearse, but that album in between, Still Life, is that perfect culmination of what they learned from My Arms Your Hearse and what they were about to accomplish with Blackwater Park. An amazing concept album, I love the story being told as heart, uh, heart-wrenching and haunting and dark as it is. The music on this album is absolutely incredible, and I wish they would play more off of it. White Cluster is probably the most perfect ending to a concept album there could be in this style. It's just a perfect Opeth album that not enough people talk about. Again, unless you're really into Opeth, I mean, you might know your Blackwater Parks, you probably know your Ghost Reveries, probably Watershed, but unless you dig just that little bit deeper, you may not even know about Still Life, and you need to give this album a shot and understand what an underrated masterpiece of an album this truly is. Coming in at number six, 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 well, that probably would have worked better for Demonic. Oh well. But it's Testament with the Gathering. Taking what they learned from Demonic, which was nearly a pure death metal album, they decided to incorporate more of the thrash style again. And I feel it's the perfect culmination of thrash and nearly death metal. And arguably, my favorite Testament album. Which may be a shock to some, discouraging to others, and to others, they completely understand. Dave Lombardo did his first drumming appearance on this album, and I can only imagine that his next one will be incredible when the New Testament album comes out and whenever it decides to happen. But here, the drums are so fast. The songs are so fast. I mean, when you got songs like Legion of the Dead, which is one of my favorite Testament songs, you have a song like DNR, which is one of the great opening songs I've ever seen Testament do. There's so much to love about this album. It's so fast, it's so heavy, it's so brutal, and it's Testament arguably at their angriest, and I love it for it. And you just might as well. I mean, if you want Testament, but just even heavier, but not as heavy as Demonic, but if you want them heavier from what you may know them for, easily go check out The Gathering. Coming in at number 5 is a band I'm so happy I finally get to talk about in this series, The Dillinger Escape Plan with Calculating Infinity. This debut album, the lone album with Dimitri on vocals, is one of the most absolutely insane albums you will ever listen to. And I'm not saying that as a hyperbolic statement, I truly mean it. Considered to be one of the first mathcore albums, which if you don't understand what that is, it's where you take time signatures, add them together to create other time signatures or make them flow together, hence the math part. And then also the hardcore, grindcore elements, hence the core part. And you add that together and you create a combustion of epic proportions. This album has inspired so many bands of the mathcore variety and just knowing that this is the most insane Dillinger Escape Plan album. Of course, they go all the way to the end of their career, coming up with some insane jaw-dropping riffs. This is the most insane of everything they've ever done. Everyone on this album absolutely shines, and this is not an album for the faint of heart. This is something that you just need to be in this kind of style to be able to appreciate. And, but if you want to be adventurous, if you want to take a shot at this, I highly recommend doing so because I remember checking this album out back when I would not listen to anything like this. But this was an album that absolutely changed my mind on all of it and I started to be able to actually appreciate and love this style. And the fact that this is the lone album with Dimitri on vocals, Mike Patton was the only vocalist capable of replacing Dimitri, and of course he was only on the Irony is a Dead Scene EP, but if you're going from absolutely insane vocals to absolutely more insane vocals with Mike Patton, that was the right way to go. But yes, if you want to see where basically Mathcore got its start, you have to check out Calculating Infinity. Coming in at number four is considered to be Dream Theater's best album by so many people, and I understand why. It's not my favorite, but I understand why. Metropolis Part 2, Scenes from a Memory. The concept album based on the song Metropolis off Images and Words, which happens to be my favorite Dream Theater album, really explores the backstory of what was going on with that song and goes so deep and creates arguably one of the greatest concept albums of all time. In all complete honesty, and just to show you the kind of person I was back in the day, I avoided this album 
because I remember seeing the sticker on the album every time I would go to my CD store of choice, or not really choice, uh, all I had for options. It constantly said that this was one of the greatest art rock albums ever made, and I avoided the term art rock like the plague. But eventually, I put on my big boy pants, and I finally listened to it, and it really was one of the greatest musical experiences I've ever had. Of course, some of that love has died off for me over the years. I still remember that initial hit and just loving everything that I heard off of this album. It gets so heavy in songs like Home and Beyond This Life. It's got beautiful emotional songs like Through Her Eyes. Finally Free is one of the great endings to a concept album. Everything about this album is fantastic. And there is a reason why there is so much love for this album. I mean, it's the most over-the-top concept album that Dream Theater's ever made. Uh, well, maybe Octavarium when you really think about it. But at the time, there was no other album like this with how much heart and passion that they really put behind this. And of course, the debut of Jordan Rudis with Dream Theater, which makes this album all the more better. And... If you really do need to check out a Dream Theater album to know what they're really all about, this is the album to check out first. It, you might be a little hesitant to do it, for whatever reason you have, but I think this is an album that is absolutely worth checking out at least once. Coming in at number three, oh, I just felt your anus tighten up with that one. I know you're getting pissed. It's him with Razorblade Romance, and you would like to think that I put this in as a shitpost, I did not. As I mentioned before with the debut album from him, I love half of the him discography. The other half sucks, but the half that I do enjoy, I absolutely love. And Razorblade Romance is an amazing example of that. Probably my third favorite him album. And that reminds me, I should probably do a backwards marathon on this one, which I know would probably piss off every single person, whether you love or hate him. So I probably should do that. But yes, this has that great element of pop, alternative, gothic, almost doom, and of course their own blend of love metal. I understand why a lot of people don't like them. And like I just said, there's a lot of it I don't like about them either. But this is an album that I think enough time has gone by. I mean, this came out in 99 already. I think you should be open-minded and just give it a shot. Get rid of those preconceived notions. And if it's still too much for you, at least you gave it a shot. But until then, I think there's so many great heavy songs on here. There's a couple ballads that I understand why the metal gatekeepers hate the band for. But overall, it's just a package that I love. And I keep saying love and I don't mean that in any kind of punny way it just kind of comes off that way but if you just want to see you know the lighter side of what i enjoy in metal yeah him razor blade romance it's not just for the hot topic crowd i'm not a hot topic guy seriously just try it that's all i ask coming in at number two is colony by in flames one of the two best In Flames albums, in my humblest of humble opinions. This is the album where they start to experiment more with keyboards, which I love so much. And, you know, to some people, they feel like they went too far with that, especially starting with Clayman, which confuses me that people feel that way. But I can understand why people felt that way with We Were To Remain onwards. But in this album, everything is done just so tastefully. Every single song hits just the right way. The keys and the synths just hit so good. Anders sounds perfect on this album. Jesper's guitar work is just impeccable. It's just a perfect melodic death metal album. And it's one that every melodic death metal fan needs to check out at least once. And if you never have, you are truly, truly missing out if you've never checked out Colony. It has some of the band's best work on this album. And you're just doing yourself a disservice by not checking this album out. So please, I implore you, go check out Colony by In Flames. Whether you're a lapsed fan, whether you're a brand new fan, or you've been a fan all along. Seriously, give it a shot. And finally at number one is an album that took me a little bit of time to get into, but especially over the last few years, with all of the hell, torment, family death, so many things that have happened in my life. This album has come to mean so much to me, so sadly relatable, and an album that just means me near and dear to me more than I ever thought possible. Judgment 
by Anathema. This is the album where, when I interviewed Daniel Cavana, he said this is the album where the band finally started to get their shit together. And I totally understand why. Like, this is arguably one of the darkest albums Anathema has ever dealt with because it deals with so much pain and loss that actually happened to the band. And while it's not the Death Doom era, it's not the prog era, it's not the more electric era of the band, it is that alternative gothic sound. And they nail it perfectly. And I'm amazed there isn't more bands that have been influenced by this album in particular, and I kind of wish there was. I mean, there are some names out there, but this is just the kind of album where I want to hear more of this. But I also don't want people to have to experience everything that goes on in this album, because, again, when it comes to family stuff, which is so much of this album for so many different sad reasons, and sadly I can relate to it even more now as I grow older, I don't want people to have to experience these things, and unfortunately some people do, and the Cavana brothers are a sad reality of what can happen when you deal with the death of people you care about, when you see abuse happen, when you see people abusing themselves, so many different things that go into it, let alone mental health issues, which is also a huge part of it as well. This is quintessential anathema for me in that second era of anathema, right before they broke up and then got back together a few years later. This was the album that they needed to make. They needed to purge themselves of all this to be able to move forward. Sadly, if you checked out my Backwards Marathon on this, they went on to make my least favorite album right after this, but I'm glad they were able to purge their feelings out on this one, and this is one that just I just hold so near and dear to my heart. And if you check it out, and if you, you enjoy that gothic, alternative, hard rock sound, I think you'll find that this album is something that is very much worth your time. And there we go, folks, ending that millennia on a very somber note. Those are my top 10 albums of 1999. And what do you think? Did you find some new discoveries there? Am I wrong in all my choices? Did I pick some good ones out? Let me know down below. Like, comment, share, subscribe, all of that good stuff. And thanks again for being able to check out another edition of this fine series that I've been able to put out. Coming up next will be the start of the 21st century with the year 2000. No, I cannot do the Conan O'Brien voice. I apologize. But we got 22 more episodes of this and I hope you stick around for all of it. And make sure to check out any years that you might have missed out on already in the playlist that's included here. And until that next video, the next interview, review, top 10 list, backwards marathon, or any other kind of video that I put up here on the Heavy Debriefings YouTube channel, this is Josh Runk was saying, see ya.